You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 108, covering the week of February 12th through February 16th, 2018. Glad to have you back on the program. Glad to be here. Before we get started, all the usual housekeeping stuff, please follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. You can like us on Facebook at Abbeville Institute, and you can subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville INST, where you can see videos from our past conferences and, of course, this podcast as well. Not a video of the podcast, but the audio version of the podcast there, too, if you want to get it on YouTube. Uh, also, if you want to find all those social media buttons, you can go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. All those buttons are at the top of the page. You can also push the button for Amazon Smile. You can help support the Abbeville Institute, even if you're shopping at Amazon.com. Make us your preferred uh, charity for Amazon Smile. And while you're shopping, you can give us a few pennies. It's painless and it's easy. Also, while you're at abbevilleinstitute.org, give us an email address and we will give you a free ebook, Kirkpatrick Sales Emancipation Hell. That uh, is painless as well. And of course, once you give us the email address, we'll give you our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. Always remember that the Abbeville Institute exists on your generous contributions alone. So if you go to Abbeville Institute and at the top of the page you'll see support, you can click on that. It'll be a little drop-down menu and it'll say memberships for individuals. If you click on that button, you'll see all of our membership options. You can give monthly or annually. Monthly for as little as $3 or $5 a month. Annually for as little as $50 a year. And you can help us explore what is true and valuable in the, in the Southern tradition. All of your contributions are tax-deductible. Also want to remind you, as this podcast goes out, this is really the last opportunity you have to sign up for our conference on February 24, 2018 in Charleston, South Carolina. The cutoff date is the 19th of February. So if you want to get in on the conference, please register by February 19th. After that, we cannot take uh, any more registrations. So February 19th, that's it. Going out to abbevilleinstitute.org, you can click on the link in the middle of the page, and it will take you to the uh, type form sign-up page. Um, it is going to be a grand time. Ben Cooter Jones is our banquet speaker, so go on out and uh, sign up for the conference. Okay, all of that said, we had a great week at the Institute. This is, again, episode 108. We have a big announcement coming next week. Uh, for people that want to have the podcast or lectures on the go. So uh, be listening for that. But next week, I will announce that on the podcast. And that will be uh, a, a great thing moving forward. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of good stuff this week uh, for the uh, Institute and the articles that we covered. A couple of them cover the perception of the South and, of course, how the South is viewed by uh, the establishment, the historical establishment, or outside of the historical establishment, and also some things that are uh, interesting, I think, um, perceptions of not just Southern history, but the way we present Southern history and the South in general. So we'll talk about all of that. Of course, this week being Abraham Lincoln's birthday week, February 12th, we did have a piece on Lincoln indirectly, Actually, two pieces on it, Lincoln indirectly, um, in uh, in this particular week, and uh, we have spent a lot of time on Abraham Lincoln in the past, and of course, we actually had a whole summer school dedicated to Abraham Lincoln, uh, rethinking Lincoln. I think it was uh, the 2005 summer school, which had three lectures by Tom DiLorenzo, among others, and that's a wonderful. It's something that I don't often talk about in the podcast, but we have well over 200 free lectures on the website. Uh, under video and audio. So if you go on out there and click on that, you can get all of our past lectures, all the way up from the last summer school, 2017 summer school, and uh, going all the way back to 2003. So we've got you know, 14 years of uh, material up there from our summer schools and scholars conferences, and it's all free of charge. So uh, we did have a, an entire summer school devoted to Lincoln. We've had countless articles about Lincoln, and so we didn't really have anything focusing on Lincoln exclusively in this uh, week of the Abbeville Institute, but we did have a couple of indirect pieces. So let's get started. The first piece for the week is written by one of the Kennedy brothers, uh, Donnie Kennedy, and it's entitled The South Stockholm Syndrome. And this piece kind of 
uh, works well with the last piece of the week. So the book ends the week. Uh, the last piece of the week is lies James Lowen tells us. One of the things that the Kennedys have done well, and I think that um, why uh, we like to, to publish their material on the website, they have been so instrumental in getting people interested in, in the South in a modern perspective. And so their most famous book being The South Was Right. And I remember back in the 1990s when this book came out, and how many it sold I mean, tremendous number of copies all over the United States. And the very first time I was actually introduced to the Kennedys was not through that book, but through another book they wrote entitled Why Not Freedom. And I remember reading that. And, uh, of course, the last part of that book focuses on uh, the Tenth Amendment, essentially. And I remember reading that book, and it was it was an eye-opener for me because at the time I wasn't really interested in, well, I was interested in politics, but not this this idea of federalism. My, my conception of of American politics was top-down, central government approach to politics, just like most Americans. I mean, you have issues that come up, and people will say, why doesn't the president do something about it? Why doesn't the Congress do something about it? These, this is the common knee-jerk reaction. We need the central authority to do something about it. And the problem with that and where that comes from is what the Kennedys talk about here, and that's the Stockholm Syndrome of the South, and that is this idea the South, of course, was conquered, and yet we're supposed to love the Union, and our perspective has changed over time in that we have adopted, Southerners have adopted, and Americans in general have adopted this because of the war, the idea that the center should do everything, and we have forgotten real federalism. And I think that's the most encouraging thing I can find out of the last, say, 20 years of American politics is that more and more Americans on the left and the right are looking for solutions to problems not from the center uh, uh, not from the central authority not from the central government but from the states and from the local communities on which they belong to I mean this is if you really want to affect change you got to think about the local and on my own podcast I I use a phrase think locally act locally on the Brian McClanahan show but um, it's something that I think is is important and of course this particular piece gets into the idea that you know you have you had a conquered people and uh, this conquered people has been very dedicated to the union in the period after the war in fact the entire process of reconciliation was just that how can we get back into this union how can we be part of this union again you look at the Spanish American War of 1898 and you know shaking hands across the chasm you look at much of the Confederate monuments and symbols that uh, were accepted by the North after the war. You have photos of Calvin Coolidge holding a Confederate battle flag and returning those flags. You have pictures of Warren Harding in front of a battle flag. Of course, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Grover Cleveland was often criticized for being the guy that talked about returning Confederate battle flags. He actually issued the rebel flag order, was going to, and then rescinded that order after the heat he took from the uh, Grand Army of the Republic. But it was Teddy Roosevelt, whose mother was a Georgian, a proud, unreconstructed uh, Southerner, who uh, was the one who said that Confederate battle flags should be returned. And perhaps that was fitting because maybe it was only the Republican Party that could do this. You know, Cleveland being a Democrat, I think there are partisan politics involved in that more than anything else. But Roosevelt being a re Republican, a progressive Republican, was able to issue an order saying you know, these flags should be sent back to the South. They're their flags. And um, I think that's, a, that's an interesting development. And, of course, the, the, the construction of Confederate monuments, which the process began in the 1870s. Uh, many of these monuments were built. The, the first one in uh, Columbus, Georgia, for example, was built of wood. That wasn't going to last, so they had to raise money to build stone monuments. But that was all a part of reconciliation. And what uh, Kennedy points out is that, okay, all that was fine and dandy, as the North essentially was was uh, part of the bargain, and that they would honor Southern leaders like Lee and Jackson and say these people were ours, too. These people were quintessential Americans, uh, that Lee, I mean, you look at Herman Melville and what he wrote, that looking at Lee was like looking at Washington. You couldn't, you couldn't think of that, but that's what it was. And so as long as these people were honored in the South, uh, the deal was fine. I mean, look, okay, you had great men, we had great men. Let's get back to the Union. Let's get back, let's resume this Union. But that wasn't really the point moving forward. In fact, that resumption of the Union, that was really Lincoln's idea 
resuming the Union. He talked about resumption rather than reconstruction, and so it was recognized, well, maybe Lincoln's uh, uh, reconstruction plan was better. Uh, this 10% plan that he had, let's let him up easy. I mean, this was the whole point. Uh, but then you get a process by which the South is going to begin to be demonized. It will become the insignificant other, the evil in America. And so at that point, you know, the deal was essentially broken. And so now you have a situation where you have this invective, this viciousness against the South, uh, and that the South is the, is the wellspring of every problem in American history. Uh, current problems and previous problems. I mean, this is it. It's the South that becomes the specimen that has to be studied. And so Southerners are under this delusion that somehow the North likes us and that um, you know, we should be uh, you know, part of this grand uh, union. And I think that's, that's an interesting position uh, because, uh, as he points out, this is, this is a Stockholm Syndrome, and it, was, it had to do with the kidnapping of uh, Patty Hearst and how she essentially loved her captors. That's what the Stockholm Syndrome is. You love your captors. And so the Kennedys believe the South is a captured place. And uh, why should we continue to love the Union? Why should Southerners continue to love the Union when it doesn't love them back? And when you look at, uh, so you, you have this wonderful piece, and he brings up the South as you know, punished by poverty. It's been impoverished by the North. It's been subjected to terrible things by the North. And all the Southerners have done is just continue to support this union. But this is where you look at things like federalism and maybe more regional control. And Southerners have talked about these things, and now even Northerners are talking about these things to try to handle issues that they think, you know, the South is holding the North captive, you know, for various social issues and political issues. Maybe the North needs to secede. And I think it, originally, when you look back in the 19th century, the North was the uh, was the first section to really advocate secession. You know, actually going back in the 18th century, as early as 1794, the North is talking about secession because they realize they're not going to get what they want out of this union. And so maybe if the North had seceded, then uh, the United States would have been different. Uh, the the South was America at that time. This Jeffersonian vision of America, maybe, and the North was the odd. It was the peculiar section, not the South. And so we have this re, this return of you know Balkanization in many ways. And uh, even uh, Rush Limbaugh was talking about that on his show. That well, maybe this is something that's this development, this trend is going to continue. And to to give you a to hammer that point home, Ryan Walters on the 16th wrote a piece entitled "Lies James Lowen Tells Us," and of course James Lowen being one of the most notorious anti-Southern uh, writers in America, and um, he's written "Lies My Teacher Told Me," which of course Clyde Wilson has parodied in his book "Lies My Teachers Told Me" for uh, uh, for Shotwell Press, and of course uh, by an article that he wrote under the same title has been published at the Abbeville Institute. Uh, but Ryan does a fantastic job of going through this book and other writings by James Lowen and pointing out all the inconsistencies. You know, Lowen has this strange fascination with Abraham Lincoln. And this is something Lincoln scholars often do. Uh, they'll, they'll recognize that Lincoln was a racist. And, and uh, well, but Lincoln wrestled with these things, and he was more open about it than anyone else. So we should give Lincoln a pass. Why? Why should we give the Republican Party of the 1850s a pass? when the Republican Party was avowed to be the white man's party. This is what they said. This is what they said in their campaign literature. They often pointed to the Democrats as being the party of miscegenation, the Democrats as being the party of mixed-race people that because of where it was located in the South. And they said the Democrats are the ones who are the enemy of the white man, not the Republican Party. We're the party of being for the white man. Uh, and they're, they're, particularly in the Midwest and the West, their literature was, was saturated with this stuff. And so why do the Republicans get a pass? Their, their objective, as Hiram Rhodes Rebels pointed out in Reconstruction, was simply to use former slaves as pawns for political power. Why do they get a pass on these things? They shouldn't. And, of course, Lowen misses so many things in his book uh, and some of his writings, you know, talking about uh, when he says things like the South was fighting against states' rights because they were fighting against personal liberty laws. Well, in a way, I mean, they did mention that nullification was a problem. But the problem with all of this, and we can look at this as a political question, how nullification is going to be used, and this is an issue we're talking about now, uh, you can have anti-commandeering laws where uh, you can say we're not going to use state resources to uh, support laws we don't like, 
we're not going to tell our state officials they have to enforce federal law. And this is actually 100% true. Uh, But the problem was, when you look at, say, personal liberty laws, is that they were nullifying a part of the Constitution itself. The, The question of nullification is, can you nullify unconstitutional acts? And so when you look at the personal liberty laws and attempting to knock down the fugitive slave law, well, the fugitive slave law was included in the Constitution. We can say this is a horrible thing, that uh, the the idea that uh, you should be able to round up people uh, for trying to escape to freedom is a horrible thing in the 21st century. But at the time, it was part of the Constitution. And so this is where Southerners are saying, look, you're violating the Constitution by doing this. It's in that you, you cut the deal. And so now you're just not even going to be party of to the compact any longer uh, by nullifying something that's in the Constitution. Now, if you nullify, like, say, the sedition law, you can say, well, this is a violation of the Constitution. The federal government can't pass a law like that because it violates the First Amendment and the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. And so that really would be using nullification in a constitutional way, which is what the founding generation said they would do. If the general government passes a law that violates the Constitution, it's no law. Uh, you can look at the tariff question. Even that one is sus- is subject to debate as to whether uh, this was a valid use of nullification. Now, you can say, well, a protective tariff violates the general welfare clause because it does not burden each section equally or benefit each section equally. It's going to burden the South more than the North and benefit the North more than the South. So you can say, does this support a... Uh, a proper reading of the general welfare clause. But, I mean, all of these things are not questions that are asked. Uh, Lowen's simple objective is to demonize the South, and he says it up front. Now, remember, James Lowen is a sociologist. He's not a historian, and that's okay. I mean, we we talk about amateur historians all the time. And uh, Dr. Livingston, who's the president of the Institute, is not a historian, but he writes about history. He's a philosopher. You can, you can ask, though, is you know, philosophy the granddaddy of all subjects or history? Uh, this, is an, this is an interesting question. You know, which one is more important? Um, the study of the uh, of being and thinking or the study of the human experience? And so uh, in that regard. And so, uh, but regardless, uh, Lowen is certainly interested in criticizing the South because of, in his, in his issue, this is where you have um, people like David Blight and others. The whole point is to criticize the South for a stand on race. But this is, subje- this is a, uh, a subjective look at this because, of course, the North was complicit in all these things as well. And even though Lowen gives lip service to that, he doesn't criticize the North as he should. Even uh, Walters points out, you know, when you look at C. Van Woodward's The Strange Career of Jim Crow, uh, he says, look, segregation, Jim Crow came out of the North. Uh, the North didn't have any room to be lecturing the South for Jim Crow because it was the North that created this uh, this entire uh, process by which segregation, legal segregation, uh, was uh, created in the South. And uh, so this is this is these are nice bookends because you get this. I mean, look, you had at one point the deal was cut. Now you've got people like Lowen uh, breaking the deal. So where does the South stand? It's just under attack. Now that said, I mean, some of these, and, and of course the title lies, James Lowen. This idea of lies. This this goes all the way back to the 1860s. And so the piece on Thursday uh, by Karen Stokes, Northern Lies about the burning of Columbia. And uh, it was said when the when Columbia, South Carolina was burned by the Union itself that actually the Confederacy burned Columbia, South Carolina. And it, as Karen Stokes points out in this particular piece, this is just hogwash. There's no way that uh, that's capable of being true. And uh, there was a, a, an infamous uh, piece written by Lieutenant Colonel George Ward Nichols. He was one of uh, Sherman's staff officers. He wrote a war memoir, The Story of the Great March, and then he later wrote a piece entitled The Burning of Columbia in 1866 where he placed the blame on uh, General Joseph Wheeler. And he he said that he got this information from a well-known citizen of South Carolina, Mr. Hugh G. Well, um, the, the, the fact is 
he never interviewed him. And in fact, uh, Alfred Huji later wrote a letter to the, um, uh, let's see, where did he write this letter? To the New York World, denying that this even existed. In fact, Huji said this, My conviction is that Columbia was cruelly and uselessly sacked and burned without resistance after being in complete possession of General Sherman's army. But who gave the order to apply the torch is not one for the victims either to know or to care. Hundreds of helpless women and children were turned out to their fate. It is the historian's business to find evidence to meet the case, not mine. And my voice would never have been heard had I not been unjustly dragged before the public. The truth and the whole truth will probably never appear, but it is recorded in the high chancery of heaven where no power can make the erasure. So, Huji is saying, look, the fact is, Southerners didn't burn the city. Sherman's men burned the city, and I never said these things. So again, this is a, this is a retelling of a story with lies. And that's just unfortunate, uh, because the, the problem for the South has always been presenting its case. Even to this day, the problem with the South is presenting its case, because you have this tidal wave of public sentiment against us. And and the way our case is often presented is is unfortunately done as a reactionary. It's not done as a positive picture of the South. And that's something we've tried to do with, uh, with the Abbeville Institute, is portray a positive image of the South. Not just simply reactionary. We're reacting to uh, the invectives leveled against it by the North or anti-Southern historians from the South or the North. Uh, but to show the South, as, as our mission says, what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. What can we get from the Southern tradition? It's not just simply history that we do. We do a lot of history. But it's also to, that what can we take away from the Southern tradition that's valuable for the future. And in that regard, um, how we present that picture for all Southerners should be something we carefully think about. And there was a piece on, on uh, Wednesday written by Louis uh, Liberman where he talks about that. Southern art and design doesn't matter unless you're on the left. And it's we have to really start thinking about how to sell the South. What What is it about the South that can actually offer something for modern America? So we have this position where we're being constantly pummeled in, 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 uh, in the press and in histories and other things, and we've got lies being told about us. And so how do we present our our position with humor, I mean, this is something that uh, Will Rogers, for example, did very well. He made fun of the North all the time. And it's something that music does very well, this positive affirmation of what the South is. Uh, and so we have to think about these things. We have to think about Confederate monuments as beautiful works of art. There's a his comedian, Chad Prather, who said this. Look, all we got to do is call them art. And then you can't take them down because you can have, you know, a pile of snot be considered art. So why wouldn't a beautiful equestrian statue be considered art? Why would we take that down? It reflects a time. Uh, if we can have palaces in Europe where slave labor was used, uh, if we can have these things. If we can have statues of kings in Europe. Why can't we have statues of southerners? In the South, the great examples of, of uh, you know, great men of the South, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. Why can't we have these things? Uh, and it's not necessarily just about the victor or the vanquished. It's about symbols of great men. And Lee was a great man. And Jackson was a great man. So this is the question that we, that we have to answer and, and understand. And how do we sell the South moving forward? How do we make the South a positive affirmation of things that are important about the South, what is true and valuable. And doing it through humor is important, doing it through art, doing it through music and literature, of course, all of these things, they will last longer than anything else the South has ever produced moving forward. They will last longer than those things, than the political tradition. We, who knows what the f future holds with the political tradition of the South? And we would talk about a lot about decentralization now, and I'm encouraged by that federalism, a return to these things, a discussion of these issues, which was not possible more than 20 years ago, but now is, and coming up with local solutions to problems and people saying enough is enough. We don't need the president to make these decisions. And uh, we often criticize we don't want the president to have all this power, except when we want him to do something we want him to do, then we want him to have all that power. And this is just ridiculous. 
But the thing is, the the part of the South that will last the longest is why we've done, I think, five or six summer schools on Southern literature. Uh, we're, we're our summer school this year. We haven't had an official announcement yet. It's going to be on music, though. Uh, why we've done uh, uh, summer schools and other events on uh, Southern tradition through literature and and music as well. We've had these things discussed. Um, and it's philosophies, it's political philosophies. These things will last. Even if every symbol of the South is torn down, even if the South is under continual attack. And they will last because people understand that they are valuable. But we have to learn through humor and a positive affirmation of these things how to ensure that our message gets out. That is the important thing to take away from uh, Lieberman's piece, is how do we do that? And of course, he has two very funny uh, little pieces of art that he used. But how do we do this and make it to where, you know, through satire, through, uh, through comedy, through simply singing about the South, you know, singing me back home, how do we do these things to where people can still love where they're from? Food. I mean, food will last uh, beyond... Uh, any other attacks against the South. These things will last. They're a lasting contribution to the American experience. And so um, even if the South has continued to be you know, demonized, uh, there is a bond among Southerners for these pieces of culture that are important. And that gets us into the last piece of the week, which is a, a review of um, Catherine Savage uh, Brosman's book, uh, a book of hours. Uh, it's her uh, a, a memory of uh, Manos, and uh, it's a collection of poems, and it's reviewed by David Middleton, who's one of our great scholars, uh, literary figures. And uh, the title of this piece is "Finished in Beauty and in Memories," and it's it's a collection of poems. So if you're not uh, interested in poetry, maybe it's not for you. But everyone should be interested in poetry. In fact, it's been said you should read a little poetry every day. And when uh, when you're looking at the Renaissance period, which has its own problems, but one of the things that they wanted to do with curriculum was ensure that people read poetry, uh, because having a little poetry in your life is a nice thing. It uh, grounds you in, in, the, in the people and the place, and uh, that's what uh, Middleton says about this. You know, it's memories. It's the memory of mankind that will keep the South alive, and it's these personal memories, personal recollections. I mean, in so many ways, that's what the South is. It's a personal connection to something. And it's the people in the place. It's that personal response to where you're from and where your people are from that makes the South interesting. And I think that's the nice thing about Southern literature and Southern music. It's that. You have to find something. It's that personal connection. Now, it doesn't mean that people in the North don't have a personal connection to things. They do. But I think Southerners, more than any other people, have that because they were defeated, because of this issue that they had lost. And so their personal connection to something that is being criticized is going to be much stronger than to those who are the victors. Uh, and I think that's the memory. You know, John Lukacs said, history is the memory of mankind. And as long as you can keep the memory alive and a positive affirmation, that becomes a very beautiful and long-lasting uh, part of a tradition, and, and it creates a tradition. So uh, to have a, a collection of poems about memories, and some of these memories are very personal, as Middleton points out, you know, personal recollections of her husband and uh, traveling in their, in their uh, old age and um, how um, this was dangerous. She brings that up, and uh, so, but it's also about you know people in a place. And uh, thankfully, she actually came to our last summer school, and you can get these lectures as well, and read some of her poems there, and they're wonderful. It's a collection of uh, poems about Louisiana, and um, you know, so it's it's certainly a um, a validation of this idea of a people in a place being an important part of tradition, um, and loving where you're from. And being positive about where you're from, where you live, if you are a native Southerner or, or an adopted Southerner, but where you live. 
And even if you're a northerner, you know, the, uh, Bradford even talked about he understood he 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 understood why many northerners were proud of where they were from. I mean, even if you're that, it's that it's that pride and place that matters for a tradition. And so Southerners need to have that positive attitude, that positive affirmation of things, and not just be simply knee-jerk reaction. And um, to understand that the, the, the reconciliation is over, the deal has been broken uh, by countless people, but also to, to be positive about where we live and where we're from and, and um, uh, the people in the place and the culture. Until next time, good day.